It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Brianna Wu is here. She's got a big announcement. Mm. We'll also talk to Mike Elgin, Dwight Silverman, Jiffy, or is it Giffy, sold for a huge amount of money to Facebook. Why is the U.S. government about to sue Google for monopolizing online ads? What Apple's AR glasses might look at? And then a close-up look at Unreal Engine 5. It's all coming up next on Twit. This Week in Tech comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 771, recorded Sunday, May 17th, 2020. Ferment all the things. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud? Wasabi is enterprise class cloud storage at one fifth the price of Amazon S3 and faster than the competition with no fees for egress or API requests and no complex storage tiers. Start a free trial at wasabi.com. Enter the offer code TWIT. And by ZipRecruiter. During this time of change, ZipRecruiter's focus hasn't changed. They're still doing what they've always done, helping people find work and helping businesses find the right people for their open roles. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. And by LinkedIn Learning. A lot of things are changing in our professional lives. With over 16,000 courses taught by industry experts, LinkedIn Learning is where you can get skills like how to master working from home, entrepreneurship foundations, or how to be a resilient leader. Try one month free at LinkedInLearning.com slash twit and by extra hop the cybersecurity company that helps modern enterprises protect their business and keep critical systems available with cloud native threat detection and response check out the full product demo and more at extrahop.com slash twit it's time for twit this week in tech show where we cover the week's Tech News, Dwight Silverman joining us, the tech burger himself. Actually, you're on HoustonChronicle.com slash tech burger, B-U-R-G-E-R. But I, then I think of you as a burger, B-U-R-G-H-E-R, like the like the mayor of the town of Tech Burger. So you think I should add a redirect for Tech Burger <laughs> with an H, Leo? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hey, Dwight, <laughs> in the Houston Chronicle building for the first time in months. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Is it quiet? It's, it is very quiet. We've been away since March. Been working at home since then. Uh, it is. Um, it is really. I like working at home normally. Uh, I don't like working at home <laughs> under these conditions. Yeah. But it's yeah. it's really it's really good to be back, and it's 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 pretty empty here because everybody is working from home. What Even we, our uh, copy editors and folks who lay out the print edition. What we do as yeah as uh, bloggers and as podcasters can be done at home, but I, I always think of a newspaper as a big, big room with people yelling and running around and banging on typewriters. And then, of course, in fact, Jeff Jarvis tells a story of he was he was there to uh, computerize. I think it was the Examiner because they had still had typewriters, and they brought in whatever the first computer system was. But even then, you couldn't go home and do it. You had to come in. Right. Right. And we do, you know, our business I work in the business news section. We have uh, weekly Zoom conferences. Uh, do you file? Do you file like a Word document and then the typesetters get it or? No, no, we have our we use uh, a um, content management system called CCI. It's based out of Europe for print. And then we have our own proprietary uh, software for uh, doing web stuff. And so everything is just done kind of in this one thing. And you can do it from anywhere. Anywhere. And yeah. it helps to be able yeah. to collaborate. But even, like I said, even the people who are doing uh, page layout are able to do That's it. one of the uh, things that's really changed. And, and uh, this quarantine would be a very different experience. But so many businesses that traditionally, you, you know, have to be performed on site, like a newspaper, not anymore. 
Right. And, but, for, you know, one of the things about the Houston Chronicle is we have been through enough hurricanes ah, that we know right. how sure. to kind of do this. That's and right. uh, so right. it's just like a permanent ongoing hurricane. Yeah. We were a little better prepared because of the fires in uh, Sonoma County last right. couple of years. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mike Elgin is also here. He's grounded for the time being. Our gastro right. nomad stuck at home. At least you kept the chef with you. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, my wife has been cooking up a storm and, and it's been actually great. So we've been in order to, uh, keep, keep, uh, myself from gaining weight, we've been doing massive hiking. <laughs> so lots of eating and lots of hiking. So you had gastro nomad experiences planned at gastronomad.net. Uh, yes. are, are they just all called off or? We postponed uh, two or three of them. So Provence has now been uh, booted to next year. The one that was already scheduled for next year is still on. So we're going to do two Provence experiences next year. We're still shooting for a couple of European experiences this year, later in the year. And, you know, they're opening Italy uh, on June 1st. And so See, that we'll doesn't see sound like date. a great idea, to be honest with you, but okay. I'm not sure I'd, well, I'd, I'd rush en masse to Italy right now. Well, the place where we do the experience is actually um, a farmhouse on a mountain. The nearest neighbor is oh. about a half a mile away, and the second nearest neighbor is like three miles away. And then we go to people's homes. So we go to, instead of going to a winery in a tasting room, we'll go to the winemaker's house and do tasting at her house and that sort of thing. So we, we are, it's a, most of our, some of our experiences, especially the European ones, Provence and and, and uh, Italy, they're already kind of socially distancing oriented already. So I think we can, I think we can do it. Plus, people are dying to travel, so yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think it'll happen. You know, I know well, he I won't we'll do it if it's not it. safe, but it sounds oh, like it's oh, possible. It'd be, I do fantasize about like moving my quarantine, just picking picking it up yeah. and putting it somewhere. Right. So maybe that's that's the that's what you offer, an alternative space exactly. to quarantine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Also joining us, Brianna Wu. Well, <laughs> so now we're gonna have to change your lower third. Yeah, I guess we are. I got oh a gosh. depressing email from you last week. You've decided you to did. call off your campaign. I did. Um, you know, I'm running against an incumbent and it's just not possible to beat someone that's been there for as long as uh, Stephen Lynch has been there. If you can't, <laughs> if you can't knock on doors, if you can't hold events, if you can't give speeches. Um, one of the things with digital is you're essentially talking to people that already support you if you're right. holding digital events. So right. um, I just didn't feel good about, you know, using my, uh, you know, my supporters money to support something that I didn't feel I had a mathematical chance of winning. So it was, uh, the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, it's hard throwing away three years of work wow. because we had all the other pieces of the campaign in place. We had a, a killer field team, but, um, you know, it's just this, this coronavirus. I, I could not ethically put my team in a position where they were risking their lives. Yeah. Rightly so. I, I understand. Yeah. It's, you know, we got a challenge in general because we've got a big election coming up in November yeah. and it's going to be. Yeah. What happened to the primaries? Are they all just canceled or? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> we were like in the middle of this gung ho primary <laughs> season and they just mm, flatlined. Just over. Pause. Well, it's kind of a relief, isn't it? I mean, how many more debates can we handle? I know. I know. Yeah. I I'm all debated out. Yeah. <laughs> Could have, could have actually stopped about five debates earlier, if you ask me. But. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the tech industry does not slow down. I thought when uh, we you know we sh started sheltering in place two months ago, oh, boy, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like in two months. There'll be no stories. But you know what? The tech industry seems to be going gung-ho. For instance, this week, Facebook announced it's buying, is it Giphy? Jiffy? <laughs> I still don't know. For Giphy. Giphy? Giphy. It's Jiffy. Giphy. Giffy. I'm calling it Yeefy. Do you mind if I call it Yeefy? Yeefy. 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 It sounds like we're all having seizures. <laughs> I, I, I think Giffy would call it Giffy because, because Giffy actually ran um, a, a series of, I don't know, promotions or something a while ago where they basically said it's the it's the GIF that keeps on giving. They were doing puns like that, which indicated that they use a hard G, but that's just one data point. I don't think this will ever be resolved. <laughs> 
In the meantime, I feel like if you're going to spell your company like name G I P H Y, you're asking it to be called Jiffy. Yes. Yes. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you spell it J I F F Y? No, because no, no, Stafford? it's a pun. It's a play on a GIF, but it's a GIF. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so you think the company calls it Giffy? I do. That's such a terrible name. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, they, I'm glad they got sold. Well, now, now they call it Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting <laughs> because uh, does Giffy have any way of uh, monetizing? I mean, they're everywhere. They're on Twitter. They're on Slack. They're, of course, on Facebook. About half the traffic, according to uh, Axios, for uh, Giphy comes from people using Facebook, searching for animated GIFs, and then using Giphy to put them into their messages. Uh, that's the primary use for it. I suppose they might make a little money selling special GIFs when the next Star Wars comes out, something like that. But it really is, there's no ads in Giphy, is there? I think there no. are ads. Yeah. I think are if you there? go to the site, I think there are. Oh, on the site, but no. Oh, yeah, on the site? site when you create it. But yeah. who creates the yeah. content? No. I mean, it's 90% yeah. of, I guess 99% of the users are just doing it in the keyboard. Yeah. And, you know, even Apple's messages, you type, you know, you search for GIFs and that's GIFs. <laughs> that's what you're going to get. <laughs> So that's where you, that's where you're gonna jet. So, but the, but and by the way, very popular. Uh, they said that they have 300 million daily active users. So it's a it's a lot of people use it. They must have huge expenses. Why then is it worth? Get ready, 400 million dollars to Facebook. Well, here's one uh, here's one thing to consider when you are sharing. GIFs and or GIFs on Twitter, on Tumblr, on anywhere, you will now be sharing a little bit of a little piece of Facebook, a, a little, little bit a of little, you going yeah. Facebook, going everywhere. And it's kind of like it's kind of like Facebook getting their claws into all the other social networks, because if you know, most most of the uh, uh, GIFs shared these days are shared on messaging platform. They're shared on Facebook or its competitors. Right. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a it's kind of a. I don't know what exactly how they're going to monetize it from a dollar and cents point of view, but it is a power play. It basically point makes Facebook really ubiquitous. I think it also tells you how valuable data is. That really, yes. you don't need to monetize because what you're getting is now you know what Twitter users are doing, what Apple Messages users are doing, what Slack users are doing. You have all sorts of additional information. And I don't know how much the, the Jiffy keyboard gives facebook when you use it but i'm gonna guess it gives you them more than just what jiff you searched for and also you know they were they actually came in under their their latest uh valuation they just did a rat funding round uh, that valued them at 600 million wow so facebook actually got a bargain a bargain a half billion it also comes bargain it also comes. I mean, but look at it this way. Program. It's it's. I definitely agree. Privacy and data has got to be part of it. But it's also it's just a feature. I mean, whenever I'm forced to use Facebook, I, you know, this is a method of communication that it's it's a great way to leave a, a, a fun comment or a sarcastic. Oh, response. I love it, and I think everybody right. loves it. In right. fact, it's In the bane. Way, it's the bane of Slack. I actually had to yell at my team and say, "Stop putting animated <laughs> gifs in the freaking general channel. I can't keep track of what's going on." <laughs> we no, have but, a I gif mean, channel it. just for it. You have to have a channel just for the humorous fun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, but I mean, this way they can, um, yeah, they can go through. They can uh, put their moderation policies uh, in place. Make sure there's not stuff coming up that's, uh, you know, inappropriate for different channels. So I think, in addition to the data, it's just, it's a, it's a feature. It's like when Apple tried to buy Dropbox. It's just something as part of it. Facebook can certainly drop this money. It's a no-brainer, really. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to make it be scary and spooky. That's going to be part of. <laughs> it's going to be part of Instagram, and it's a, a quarter of all traffic to Jiffy goes through Instagram. So it's very popular, but it's not a unique yeah. feature. And I, and I don't. I doubt that. Here's how you'll know if if Facebook says, "Oh no, it's unique. We only we, we own it. You can only use it on Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp." Then you're right, Brianna. It's a feature that's so valuable. They're willing to spend $400 million because people love it. And they're taking it away from Twitter and Slack and Apple and everybody else. But my guess is they won't. My guess is they'll make it even more available to more people. That costs them money. Yeah. That's yep. a lot of data. That's a lot of servers. It, but it's, it's also 
inbound data. And I, I wonder, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out, but how much, what do they get location information? Do they get, what do they get if you're using Well, here's one Giphy. thing they get. So one thing to consider is the fact that one quarter of Giphy's traffic, you can't say it without being self-conscious. I know, Giphy. I hate this. I hate it. <laughs> Rename it uh, One quarter, One quarter of the usage of their service is actually on Instagram. So in, by buying it, Facebook is making sure nobody else buys it. So yeah, Instagram is currently true. heavily reliant on, on this service. Right. And so they figure, well, let's just own it so that we don't have problems. I bet it's used on Snap, which is, yep. a, you know, Facebook and Instagram are their arch rival. Um, there, there are other, there's another service, but I mean, Jiffy is the main service uh, that does this, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Mike, that's such a good point too, because uh, the thing is I would, I'm not a fair use lawyer, but imagine if someone else bought this and cut off Facebook and Instagram's access to it. They couldn't really go through and pull up all those movies and stuff as a giant company to recreate this data set very ah. easily because it's it's user generated content. So I would imagine, I mean, it's not like Apple Maps where, you know, they can go create their own thing. I think it's uniquely valuable in that way. According to yeah, the Medium post from the Jiffy uh, company, their API will not go away. Jiffy's GIF stickers, emojis aren't going anywhere. We'll continue to make Jiffy openly available to the wider ecosystem. So, I mean, of course, you know, the, the acquisitions, people always say stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to guess this is valuable to Facebook over and above the value that uh, of simply putting funny dancing bears in your <laughs> messages <laughs> it's it is it seems to me often the case in technology that the silliest stuff is actually the most nefarious you know the dark yeah. patterns show up as dancing bears more often yeah. than not <laughs> right maybe that's just me looking for a story i don't know facebook is launching a in fact maybe uh, brianna you were talking about creating a uh, i think this you absolutely should and i want you to encourage you to do this so maybe a political action committee on tech issues, since that's your expertise. Facebook is setting up what the Washington Post calls a dark money group, advocacy group in Washington called American Edge. Maybe they call it dark money because, as you know, Washington Post's motto is democracy dies in darkness. Yeah. Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's... Uh, the setup allows it to navigate a thicket of tax laws in such a way it can raise money and blitz the airwave with ads without the obligation of, and this is why it's dark money, disclosing its donors. The yeah. NRA does the same thing uh, as an example. American Edge has a good name. It's like, let's keep our edge. Let's keep innovation. And it comes at a perfect time because, now, and I, I, I read this story and I thought, well, that's the Washington Post. Rupert Murdoch's uh, journal going after Google, but the Post had a, a, a big article that the U.S. government is getting ready to sue Google. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Department state attorneys general likely to bring antitrust lawsuits against Google. Focused on the ad business, there's no love lost between the Wall Street Journal and Google. We know that. Uh Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton and uh, some other attorneys general are likely to file a case probably in the fall, people familiar with the matter said, focused on Google's online ad business. It's funny because we had a little hiatus in the uh, anti-tech, you know, the tech lash, because oh. without tech, this quarantine would be a little bit tougher for everybody. But now it's coming back. Or maybe it's just the Wall Street Journal trying to gin up some... Um, Andy Tech I think the, I think the New York Times also had a uh, had its own separate report. Did they? Okay. Well, yeah, it's typical. Ken Paxton, who's the Texas Attorney General, who by the way is remains under indictment, um, is a uh, it, it jumps into a lot of these. He was early on in the uh, in the state attorneys general lawsuit to try to block the T-Mobile Sprint merger. Ah. And uh, and he settled with them relatively early. He kind of pulled out of it after a while. It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, if there's something that Google will do for Texas or for him, uh, have him settling quickly. Wall Street Journal uh, says that uh, Attorney General William Barr has devoted considerable resources to the Google probe, continues to treat it as a top priority. 
They have a quote from him that says the Justice Department will make a final call this summer. I'm hoping that we bring it to fruition early summer, Mr. Barr said. And by fruition, I mean decision time. <laughs> well, does is anybody worry that this is just purely political? Um, oh, uh, yeah. You oh, saw yeah. The, yeah, tr- the tweet yesterday from uh, the president? The most chilling tweet ever from the from from President Trump. He said that uh, he said that yes, the uh, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, are run by far left people, and we're going to do something <laughs> about it. I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> and so that is not good for the president yeah. to be saying that. I uh, I've long ago blocked his account, so let me see if I can f- <laughs> I can find yeah. I can find it. But uh, yeah, it was a scary. Um, a scary thing, because it sounded yeah. like he was saying we're going after them because yeah. uh, they're propaganda for the left. Well, I think that's what's so yes. frustrating about this, right? Because I think all of us would agree we want regulatory oversight of Google's ad business. It's a fact that they've paid some of the largest fines in history in Europe. It's a fact that they've moved into anti-competitive behavior on many occasions. And you know, even with Facebook, I, it doesn't surprise me that they are putting out you know something to formally advocate for themselves and to push Congress the way that they would want. Congress to move. I, I it's it's just so frustrating because we need that kind of oversight from the Justice Department. But because you have a president that's talking about it in such partisan terms, it really politicizes the Justice Department and it 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 becomes not about protecting people from what's effectively an advertising duopoly. It becomes just another partisan screaming match. And that's what's so disappointing about it. Yeah. Because, I mean, I think we'd all agree that some – it's a conversation that has to happen. I mean, tech has gotten very big, and there's some serious and legitimate concerns. Yeah. It's not It's not that we're saying, oh, no, it's wonderful and it's perfect, but uh, it is a little – why did you find it chilling, Michael? Well, he basically said that uh, – first of all, he characterized the owners. Like, he's, he's zeroing in on the – individual people who own the services and saying that they their politics is far oh, left interesting. and 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 indicated that he's going to do something about it so th- that's a lot of posturing he's doing a lot of posturing lately but essentially um you know i i in political science a conservative republican is in favor of minimizing government um uh meddling with businesses in a fascist dictatorship, the dictator is interested in using the government to go after the people who own sources of content that disagree with his politics. That's the difference between a conservative and a fascist. Yeah. That's one of the differences. And so his statement, his tweet, uh, taken just by its by itself, is the statement of a fascist dictator. Now, mm-hmm. this may appeal to part of his base. Uh, and he may just have been in meetings where they're talking about they're going to have antitrust a- effort against some of the uh, some of the tech companies. And then he was responding to Michelle Malkin, I believe it was, who was talk who were, who was talking about the leftist leanings of social media uh, uh, owners. And he was replying to that and saying, "Yeah, we're going to do something about that." So who knows? Who knows? You can't trust anything this guy tweets, obviously. Yeah. But but taken on its face, it was just a horrifying. Uh, thing to say for a president. But so much of what he says is bluster and so much of what he says is uh, posturing and and playing to a base. Uh, you don't know if any, any of that would ever come to fruition. I agree with you that it's kind of a horrifying statement on its face until you look at who's actually saying it and, and uh, how often he says things like that that don't, you know, amount to much uh, other, than, other than to rile his base. You know, every time there have been serious uh, hearings on tech issues. Uh, a lot of the Republicans try to hijack them with discussions of unfairness on social media, yeah, yeah. and and it and it's just that it's it's a hijack. It's not a real issue, and um, but it's something that they could use to to you know to get the base going, and they've got a, yeah. a base to get to the polls in November. But Dwight, I'd I'd love to add on to that. You know, this stuff is, it's not just bluster. There was another story that came out this week that Google 
nuked their inclusion and diversity programs because they were afraid of these exact kind of characterizations from uh, from the uh, conservative Isn't movement that in this shame? country. That, that, um, that to say I'm pro diversity. Right would brand you as a radical leftist. Exactly. And, you know, um, I I have worked with a lot of the people at Google. They've done the unconscious bias training. It's excellent. It's really good stuff. For me, it's, it's stuff that made me consider some of my actions because people don't know this. Women have uh, the exact, uh, it's just a 2% difference uh, in unconscious bias against other women as men do. So, you know, this stuff, it's not just bluster. It's work in the ref. It's uh, it's I like it that. Reframes the rest. I, agree with that yeah. phrase. I love it. Good phrase. Good phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so so just, to be, just to be very specific about about this tweet we've been talking about, um, specifically, he, he wrote the radical left is in total command and control of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Google. The administration is working to remedy this illegal situation. Stay tuned, etc. Yeah. So he's saying that th that for people to be in charge of Facebook who whose politics are leftist is illegal. That's what he asserted. Right. Oh. It's illegal to be left-leaning and own a company like and Facebook, course, Instagram, Twitter, or Google. Where did he announce it? On Twitter. Exactly. <laughs> right. right. It's very confusing. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm very confused. Uh, Twitter, which will, not, which will not block him, yeah. even when his tweets can be incitement to violence. Right, or... or where he tweets something that, uh, you know, they would block if anybody else said it because it's scientifically unfactual about the COVID uh, right. virus. It, but right. but uh, he is the president. And so I understand their point of view there that, well, you, can't, you know, he's the president. So you got to you got to let him tweet. It's ironic. Well, they should they should do to him what Facebook has done to me. So for for many many years, while I was still using Facebook and Instagram, I was a, a harsh critic of Facebook, and I ended up no doubt on some list that basically said none of my stuff is going to be widely distributed or can go viral. So my my Facebook posts, my Instagram posts, just everything lands with a thud uh, because. I am part of this. They they did this whole. They had this whole uh, group that was there to prevent fake news and terrorist content and all this other objectionable stuff uh, from going viral at all. And so they lumped into that sort of anti-Facebook people. And so that's what they should do to Trump. They should sort of let him say whatever he wants to say. It goes to the people who follow him. But you know, don't let it be amplified by the mechanisms of of of, so, of Twitter. But this is where you talk about a shadow ban. You talk about a shadow. Yeah, ban. but this is but, see, this is where historically we're challenged by uh, a leader like Trump. The press is also challenged because none of the norms that we have. I mean, the norm would be no, no. He's the president of the United States. He should be able to speak to the people of the United States. That norm, you you would be violating that with a shadow ban. Uh, it's why this is so challenging for the press. It's why it's so challenging for Jack Dorsey at Twitter. What do you do? It, what do you it do? It also wouldn't work, actually. And you got in a reality, crazy grandpa, and he's got a tweet. He's got a tweeter, and he's not afraid to use it. Well, it's worse than that because Trump is is actually not all that effective. If you look at the performance and engagement of his tweets on Twitter, what happens? Oh, really? Is all the media. Yes, all the media picks up his tweets, and that's where it's amplified. Wow. It's amplified by the press. That's right. why we're always hearing about Trump's tweets. It's not yeah. on that's Twitter. That's a good point. I don't follow him because it's too upsetting. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really good lesson. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm exactly as guilty of it as many other people are, but there's a, there's a certain tendency with Democrats that when someone on the right wing says something that's – snarkable, right? Like something you can easily make fun of. You know, you dunk on it, you quote tweet right. it for right. easy engagement. And, right. you know, for, and I don't want this to be a political show, but, you know, for, for some figures on the right, Ben Shapiro, they really depend on that kind of outrage and, and snark um, response to amplify it and help build their career. So I find that I try to be very judicious about which of Trump's temper tantrums that I amplify, because in a way you're, you're helping him win. And it's, 
it, it's so it's so difficult. You know, Richard Stengel is a former uh, – he used to work in the State Department with John Kerry. He wrote a fantastic book called Information Warfare. Um, and he talks about – like for many journalists, you, you go and you want to be an information idealist. You want to believe that the best information out there, it wins – give people the best arguments, let them make their own decisions. But the truth is in information warfare, we kind of have to be information realists and realize the effects of these things a lot more. And I I just think it's a no-win scenario. Facebook is trying to self-regulate. They've created a... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you already a laugh. Sorry, sorry. Already a laugh. (laughs) Sorry. Already a laugh. (laughs) They've created a a new uh, board... They've really revealed the first 20 members of the new review board. Those 20 will then uh, nominate another 20 for a total of 40. They're, uh, I think everybody would agree, a, a very uh, a good bunch, a diverse bunch, global, um, distinguished uh, activists as well as scholars. Um, they are going to try to help Facebook solve the content problems, which is a pretty insurmountable problem. Hate speech, harassment, protecting safety and privacy. Um, They say the board in an op-ed in the New York Times said, we will make final and binding decisions on whether specific content should be allowed or removed from Facebook and Instagram. Um, On the other hand, uh, Wired in its piece, this is Siva Vijanathan, who I love, uh, he wrote, Facebook and the folly of self-regulation, he took issue. He said, only in the narrowest and most trivial of ways does this board have any such power. It will have no influence over anything that really matters in the world. It will hear only individual appeals about specific content that the company has removed from the surface, already removed, and only a fraction of those appeals. It can't say anything about the toxic content that Facebook allows and promotes on the site. It will have no uh, authority over advertising or the massive surveillance that Facebook uses to make its ads so valuable. It won't curb disinformation campaigns or dangerous conspiracies, and on and on and on. Uh, It's an interesting idea. Uh, I commend Facebook for doing it, but it's a it's hard for any group of 40 people to, to influence what happens with a two and a half billion user service. Well, so let me throw ice water on your enthusiasm for this. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, do I do this very quickly? Uh, so, so essentially, Facebook has, has put a, another football up for the press to kick. And we're like, okay, this time she's not going to pull it away. Um what they're setting up here is like 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 he said that they, they, there's no power there it's an advisory uh, position and they they're trying to make this committee as illustrious and as respected and balanced as possible and they succeeded so at that, that. So then they, they'll just go ahead and remove what they want to remove and not remove what they don't want to remove right. and when, on those cases where they remove controversial stuff that they want to remove then that they is can also blame these guys. proved by the committee. They can say, well, they said, they said. <laughs> right. And then when they don't remove stuff that the committee uh, <laughs> advised them to do, they said, well, we have a business to run. We have our own reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a fig, fig leaf to, to, to get the press off their backs, yeah. which is their, it, it's basically their only goal here. It's also very, very narrow. I mean, they're looking at individual cases there's no guarantee that anything that they do is going to affect overall policy at Facebook. And what they're doing is they're, they're essentially presented with a case. They look at it, rule next. And there's no, you know, there's nothing there that a lot that requires Facebook to pay attention to what they're doing in terms of policy. And, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much Chrome on a car. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yep. well, there you have it. <laughs> Did I, you want to say I, anything, Brianna? <laughs> the laugh no, spoke I, I uh, absolutely volumes. absolutely agree with the pessimism. It's dead yeah. on. Yeah. Um, I, I would say it is a slight movement forward, and I do like the fact that people outside the company are going to be looking at this very narrow case of things. Um, I like the fact that Facebook has agreed to independently fund them for a few years. I think that's a step forward. Um, but is this fundamentally going to change uh, the way Facebook operates? No, it, it really strikes me as 
when Uber got into the trouble with Susan Fowler and they, they brought in, wasn't it Eric Holder to look at the culture there, yes, uh, Eric right. Holder's law firm to that's look right. at it. Yep. And they, they put that in every single press statement. So yeah. they were using someone else's credibility right. to address a fault that they've had. Um, maybe that's too cynical uh, a view here, but that's how I feel. That's exactly right. That's exactly what they're doing. Oh, well, you got my hopes up for a minute anyway. <laughs> I guess they're going to yank that football away one more time. Let's take a little break. What a panel. It's I'm going to try to find more great, deep, heavy stuff to talk about, but it, we may end up talking about uh, Unreal Engine 5 as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. Brianna Wu, back to her old role as a game developer. That's and right. She's loving it. Uh, it's also great to have you here. Uh, is there, I mean, it's just at Brianna Wu. Can we put anything else down there? You got lots of room in that lower third now. Oh my gosh. Uh, a former candidate for Congress, game developer, <laughs> head of development at GSX. I'm, can you I go back? Out what I'm doing next. Can yes. you go back to Space Cat Gal now? I, I don't think I want to. I oh. think Brianna Wu, that's more professional. So. She's got her real name for years on Twitter. <laughs> she was Space Cat Gal. That's it. Then the campaign said, you know, it'd be good. Oh, they were angry about that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it'd be good for votes if you would use your name. <laughs> it's like my team. They say, Leo, no one knows what a netcast is. Why do you persist? <laughs> Just give it up, old man. <sighs> Dwight Silverman knows what a netcast is, but he probably I don't. do. Yes. He's from the Tech Burger, HoustonChronicle.com slash Tech Burger. It's great to have you in your soundproof booth. At That's the right. yeah, it looks like a sound. How do you but... sterilize the egg cartons behind you? Do you, do you just... I just, I don't think I have to. I just won't lick them. Okay, good. Good thinking. <laughs> good thinking. Yeah, good thinking. And, of course, Mike Elgin. It's great to have Mike. I'm glad you're stuck at home. I know you're not, but I, I kind of am. <laughs> we get more. Yeah, it's it. It's actually great. I'm with family. I mean, I'm very lucky. I know there are a lot of single people who are quarantining oh, by that's themselves. that's got to be so hard. And yeah, it's got to be so awful. So I'm yeah. just so lucky to be with uh, yeah. family. You know what's worse than quarantining single? Quarantining with people you don't like. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who wish they were single. Yeah, right. And that, that happens too, I got to tell you. Uh, more often who than I, not. Who, yeah. Who I feel sorry for are uh, the parents where the school districts are doing online... Oh. Uh, education, and they're trying to work from home at the same time. That is, and I know several of the, and oh, yeah. a lot of these parents are just throwing up their hands and saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. We all. have good and friends, good friends with three school age kids from like first grade through fifth grade. And uh, there's five of them. They're all working from home. There's just not enough Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough Zoom to go around. Actually, Zoom was down this morning for about three hours in uh, many parts of the country, the Northeast, California, Texas. And it was 9 a.m. Eastern time, right when church services hit. And I think there were a lot of churches who were very unhappy that Zoom was down for three hours. We still don't know uh, why that was. Uh, Zoom says they're all back up and running. I bet there are also a few people saying, oh, thank God. No Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Just a little bit. Just give me an hour. No Zoom. Are you staying? Are you do you do you didn't did you keep somewhere to live, Mike? Or did you, are you just like uh, camping on your son's uh, couch? It's something like that. He, he has a, a bedroom. Uh, it's mostly where we stay when we are in the in California. So, yeah. so it's not, uh, it works out great. Yeah. We're all foodies. We, we're doing a lot of oh, cooking good. and stuff. We're having a lot of fun. It's it's pretty great. We're in Campbell uh, in Silicon Valley. Nice so, area, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, I have a, a prepared statement about, about Zoom, if, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, some <laughs> quick advice and, and a prediction. <laughs> yes. So the Zoom fatigue is real. Everybody's written about it. Ugh. We've all experienced it. Ugh. It's just awful. There are a whole bunch of reasons for it. There are psychological reasons having to do with latency and people staring at you. And there's all kinds of problems with video conferencing that involves lots and lots of people. And so I'm advising companies uh, in my columns to get away from them as much as possible. And those of us who have been working from home, I've been working from home, re working remotely since 2004. We didn't have all these video conferencing when we were remote and everybody else was in the office. It's just now that the managers and the leaders are working from home. Now we have to have video conferencing, oh, right? Because they're yeah. going to be touchy-feely types. Right. So so my, my advice is 
try to not have the meeting. Do it in email if you can. If you can't do it in email, do a conference call with audio. And if that doesn't work, try to keep Zoom call Zoom calls to four people or less because oh. beyond that, people go crazy. But but I, th I I'm going to make a prediction, which is I think the future of video conferencing, the thing that will replace it, will be avatar based video conferencing where people's Memoji, I, I think that Apple will probably announce Memoji on the MacBook uh, platform or the iMac platform, and people will have their emoji uh, doing their face expressions, moving their mouth, doing all the things that they would do. But, they, uh, but That's going to make it solve, worse. That no, will they, make it, it worse. solves a lot of problems. That's too, <laughs> no, that's too freaky. So we well, do. Well, we I do. don't want to have. I don't want to have a conference call with a bunch of Lego characters. <laughs> you just. You no. just. You just. You just. You. You have a Minecraft server. <laughs> you know, so that's true. I would actually. I, I would do it life. in Minecraft. You do it in second life. Yeah. Well, that's what life. this sounds like. It's, it's I have a friend of mine in the game industry. They've started holding their uh, team meetings in Red Dead Redemption. Oh, that's <laughs> so a good go idea. Around the campfire and have voice that's chat. That's a great idea. And do it that way. Yes. Can and you, you do so? There's like a people. lobby you could go into, and then everybody's in the hanging in the lobby. Exactly. Something like that. it's a we little more. Involved. That <laughs> can you if somebody says something you don't like, can you draw your six gun and shoot them? There we go. That'd yeah. <laughs> or if they say something you do like, you can share your moonshine. Either yeah, way. that's yeah, good. Right. That's okay. good stuff. <laughs> so we have we have weekly staff meetings for the entire editorial staff of the Chronicle. It's about two hundred of us, but oh. about showed up the last time. But most of them are on. I'd say probably about. 40% of them are on phone, uh, the rest are on video, and there are some who do video but don't show their faces. And and actually, we all love it because we get to see each other. It's only It only lasts about 40 minutes. Uh, the editor does much of the talking, and there are questions via chat. And it's really good to see everybody's face. Um, I have such to say, it does group. feel... Passive aggressive, not to show your video in a Zoom call. <laughs> you're just, well, you your don't name, know where they are. Just your name is there in big letters. It's like, oh yes. man, yes. that's really. But it's great, and so uh, you know, we there's there's not much anxiety uh, around it with us. Everybody kind of likes to see, you know, cats will jump in people's laps, and, and everybody enjoys that, and it's kind of more human. It humanizes right. our okay. staff, and uh, and I would not want to see a bunch of avatars. It's, well, it's well, I, still let me exhausting. Be clear, let me be killed. Yeah, let me be clear, Dwight. I'm not saying this is good. I'm predicting it will happen. Yeah. And I'm predicting Apple will launch it. Facebook just announced their emoji like rooms. Uh, yeah, avatars. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so and I so I think this is really gonna take off. I think over the you know, a year from now, avatar based video conferencing is gonna be enormous. That's we, just a prediction. I'm, when Facebook came out with favorite. spaces, you know, their virtual reality hangout, we played with that a little bit. But that's also a little it's I think it's not that we hate Zoom. I agree with you, Dwight. There's certain. It's just a, it's fatiguing. It's too much. It's fatiguing. After a while, I had we it, had last week. I did my 43rd college reunion. One of one of my old roommates got you know kind of put it together. There was only about a dozen of us. It wasn't everybody, but it was it was old friends hadn't seen each other in some cases in 43 years. In some cases, just a decade or two. It was wonderful, and seeing their faces was great. Although I have to apologize. Because one guy, I go, I don't know who this is. Who's this guy? <laughs> the whole time. And then I finally figured out who it is. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> so I apologize. It was, um, you changed a little bit. You know, it, the, <laughs> people are having a lot of fun with Zoom. And, and they're getting a lot of enjoyment at it in certain uh, circumstances. But I'm talking to a lot of people. It's exhausting. We're having two or three or four Zoom meetings a day much. with yeah. 30, 40, or 50 yeah, so people that's, on the that's call. A, that's a different scenario. Yes. But that's yeah, the that's norm. That's a different scenario. Dwight, yes. I think that's becoming the norm. Yeah. Lisa, yeah. poor Lisa, spends almost all day on Zoom. Because wow. uh, she's working out of the house. I have to get out. I have to come over here. Because <laughs> it's too, And I, the one day that I did three Zoom calls, it was like, oh. You know, and I'm on camera all day. It's not that. I don't know what it is. There's something different about it. I don't know. Do you think that uh, you know, Microsoft Build is this week? And one of the, the more interesting products I saw them debut was uh, HoloLens 2. And they did this really interesting feature with it where they would use uh, texture maps right. of your face. And they would put it over a 3D skeletal mesh to make like a 3D representation of you. It wasn't perfect, but it was, it was good. And then you could walk around it in the round. Um, you know, as we're sitting here talking today, Magic Leap has basically imploded 
like the Death Isn't Star. Sad? Oh, it's ter- it's terrible. Oh. I you know so many people laid oh. off because they hired a bunch of game industry people. But I mean, do you think that in the meeting space, like something like AR, there might be applications? Because I mean, in engineering. So much of – there's some people that can work like closing the door and working by themselves all day. I'm not like that. I have to talk to my team. I've got to diagram stuff out. Do you think that there could be limited applications for AR where you could be with the team more virtually in a way that felt more real? Because I think well, we all agree Oculus is not the answer for that. It's just too removed from everything. It feels arcadey. But I could I could see an opening for HoloLens here. I can't there, wait a for huge, the there uh, is there the, the there, new I'm Zoom totally with okay. skeletal mesh <laughs> renderings right. is going to be well, this is all the rage. Apple's the Apple glasses which I'm sure we'll okay, talk about Okay let's take a break cuz yeah. I do I yes. that you have brought up some really good stuff I want to talk about Magic Leap I want to talk about the Apple glasses there and and I think this is a really interesting conversation is you know now that we're all doing these meetings where where do we go to make them less fatiguing more productive is there is there some solution in technology? So this is a great subject. I love it. I don't want to cut you off, but let's take a, just a pause so we can uh, thank a sponsor, and we'll be right back. What a great panel. It's I love it when we get these conversations and they start flowing like this, and I hate to interrupt it, but I do want to talk about Wasabi, our good friends at Wasabi. <gasps> I heard that. Are I you, like them. They're I awesome. know. They're in Boston. They're in your na- neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. It's David Friend, who I've known for years, another Yaley. He um, he was very famous. I, he created the ARP synthesizer. He's got a his a serial entrepreneur. He created Carbonite. Uh, he has created something that I think is the next step, the next generation in hot cloud storage. It's incredible. It's called Wasabi, aptly named for hot cloud storage. Right? It's the perfect solution. If for instance, if you're a managed service provider, you're going to love it because you can make more money and still charge your clients less. That's because Wasabi is 80% cheaper than Amazon S3. Significantly, it's so it's so affordable, it's actually cheaper than on-prem storage. In fact, typically, you could store that data in Wasabi's cloud for less than just the annual maintenance fees on the same amount of on-prem storage. That's how affordable it is. Uh, David was telling me about a Boston uh, high-rise, you know, an office building, where they put in security cameras all over, and there's and they're you know these cameras are pumping out a lot of data all day every day, and they're buying hard drives. They're buying more hard drives every week. It seems like they're going out and buying more hard drives, and they're going crazy. He said they moved to Wasabi. It costs them less. It's more accessible. It's better. It's faster. It's easier. And I have to say, I think Wasabi is more secure than on-prem storage. I think it really is. First of all, they've got an incredible uh, eleven nines of durability. That's one, on average, one file every 649,000 years. They're hosted in highly secure, fully redundant tier four data centers. They do regular integrity checking where every object is checked for integrity every 90 days. That means one bit is lost. They've got a copy on the other uh, data center. They move it over. You never lose any data. It's also secure by default. All data in the cloud is, uh, Wasabi Cloud is, is, is encrypted at rest, even if you don't specify it. It's automatic. Uh, of course, they follow industry best security models and design practices. They've got access control mechanisms like bucket policies and ACLs. I, my favorite thing, though, I love this. You're, you can designate some or all of your data immutable. It cannot be erased it cannot be altered. It cannot be encrypted by ransomware. It is protected from hackers, from malware, protected from yourself. <laughs> it is it is completely safe. So this is definitely better than on-prem storage. And because Wasabi has this patented way of writing the data to hard drives, they are faster than S3. They are less expensive than S3. They don't have all the complex storage tiers that S3 has. There's no fee at all for egress. That's what That'll bite you a lot with S3 where you say, oh, this is cheap, and then you start to get your data, and it's what? API requests, they, have, they use the same API as Amazon S3, so you already know how to use it. You have software that can use it, but they don't charge for API requests. This is a completely disruptive price performance model. And now there's a new way. You can pay as you go, and it's very affordable, $5.99 per terabyte per month. That's it, flat fee. 
but you can even save more with reserved capacity storage. If you're that high rise and you you know we're going to be eating up petabytes every you know two petabytes every year, you can do reserved capacity storage. You buy the cloud storage kind of ahead of time. You can do one, three, or five year increments. And of course, the longer you the bigger the amount, the longer the tier the better the discount. So you can really bring that price way down. And there's a lot of situations where you know we're going to need this storage. We are generating this much data. So reserve capacity storage is a very good reason to take a look at Wasabi. You know, it's good to be number two. You got to try harder. You got to work harder. And that's what Wasabi is. HIPAA compliant, FINRA compliant, CJIS compliant, highly secure, disruptive technology. It's turning the industry on its ear. 80% cheaper, up to six times the speed of the industry leader. You can calculate the savings for yourself and start a free trial right now at wasabi.com. Click the free trial link. Please use our offer code TWIT so they know you saw it here. Wasabi, W-A-S-A-B-I.com. Free trial, offer code TWIT. I think you're going to, once you try it, you're going to, and it's, 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 what's nice is you're going to save so much, you can easily go to the boss and say, look what we're saving, look how good this is. I know usually bosses go, well, is it Amazon? Is it Microsoft? Is it Google? No, you don't have to. This conversation will be a lot easier. And if you're a managed service provider, your clients are going to love you. And we're going to cut your costs. We'll cut them by half. And you still make more money. Wasabi, W-A-S-A-B-I dot com. Click the free trial link and enter the code TWIT. And I know a lot of people, people like you, Brianna, who are using Wasabi for themselves, for backup, for Ooh. cloud. There's, you know, it's so affordable that uh, a lot of people are just using it not businesses, but it, but it's really intended for businesses. But I just thought I'd mention that. All right, let's talk, because I think this will tie into that future of conferencing. Uh, there's a little battle going on between two Apple rumor mongers, Ming-Chi Kuo, who is in Asia. So he's the supply chain guy. And he's, you know, I would say Ming-Chi Kuo is... Maybe 75% accurate. He's missed on a few things. He said Apple will not be shipping uh, augmented reality glasses until 2022. But there's this new guy, the new sheriff in town, a guy named John Prosser, who of late has been remarkably on. He's, he got the iPhone SE down perfectly. Quo said Apple's glasses will launch 2022 at the earliest. Prosser says, I can't believe I'm going against Quo on this one, but I believe he's wrong. Apple glasses are aimed for March, June 2021. Also, I've seen them. They're sleek as hell. We'll be showing you soon. Prosser does not, we should be very clear, does not work for Apple. Uh, he's a, you know, a tech guy, analyst. He had a YouTube channel for a while, but he's got good sources. He's been very, very accurate in the last six months. Now, you've been talking, I'm going to let Mike start with this, because you've been talking about this whole idea for a long time. You were a glass yes. hole. Yes. <laughs> in my heart, I still am. You, know? <laughs> you wore that and Google Glass for yeah. a long time. I do think that, and and that's a that's a heads up display, which is different from augmented reality, right. which 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 uh, interacts with the physical environment in ways that a heads up display like Google Glass does not. But I do believe in the Apple glasses. I do believe in the future of augmented reality. Is I actually think it's probably the thing that will replace the iPhone in terms of the central device in our lives. But I do believe that Apple is working on combining multiple devices, including glasses, together into singular experiences. One of them is what we're talking about, which is holographic meetings where, and Apple has patents for this sort of thing that they describe this very scenario where you can sit at a conference table or not, and basically you have people from the waist up, their avatars, sitting around. You can look at them. They can look at you. That's what, I, want, that that's what I always wanted to do with Twit. That's exactly. why you're in a yep. little TV screen, but it would be... I always wanted you to have a 3D rendering of Mike Elgin sitting right there, and we wouldn't have to ever, <laughs> nobody have to come, right? And it wouldn't age. That's the best part about Avatar. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but if you, if you, I if want you look at Lego a company, well, Mike Elgin, that would be great. That's, <laughs> plug me in. I'm a ready. Dot for it. on his head. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, but but if, there's, a, there's a company called uh, Spatial that is describing this. They're in the news this week as well, and they're working on this holographic meeting idea 
uh, for enterprises. But Apple's vision would be you have a MacBook Pro in front of you and it's essentially doing uh, the mapping that 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 their uh, face ID does on the iPhone, mapping you in real time. Everybody else has got a MacBook Pro in front of them. They're wearing the Apple glasses. And so what you essentially see is looking over your your MacBook Pro, you see one person there, one person there, another person there, another person there. And you can t turn and talk to them. They look at you. You make eye contact with their avatar. And this is the future of virtual meetings. This is a brilliant and infinitely doable uh, concept, uh, especially if you avatarize it and don't try to have, you know, essentially what looks like video. Uh, that that will come eventually. Back to this uh, pissing contest between these two analysts. I think uh, um, I, th I think 2022 is, is more realistic. It's one thing to predict the arrival of a of a version of an existing product. It's another thing to to predict the arrival of an entirely new platform uh, from a company like Apple. Apple's never early on these things. They sort of tend to hold back and wait until it's already happening. And then they come in and just take over with a beautiful implementation. So next year for, for Apple glasses to me feels really far fetched given what's happening or what isn't happening in the world of AR. There's no history oh, but, of but Apple my... doing developer editions. Like, so the Google glass yeah. was a developer edition. They didn't intend. Yes. And Magic Leap did the same thing. But Apple does not have a history of that. Typically, they keep it quiet. They, you know, quietly seed this to a few select developers and then announce it as a consumer product. But but, but there are they kind of did oh, though, Leo, sorry. because if you look at if you look at um, the history of Apple in 3D. So when I first started working with Apple technology uh, in 2011. Apple's 3D APIs were absolutely non-existent. They had uh, they had Sprite Kit uh, for games, which is why so many games on the iPhone when it first came out were 2D. Uh, but if you if you look at the state of things, um, they've really been making big investments into AR and 3D technology. I believe it was it was two years ago that they finally went and they supported eGPU e uh, on any MacBook or iMac or series Mac device so you could hook up a VR or AR uh, goggle set to it and start learning to work with Apple technologies uh, with with uh, with these kinds of devices it wasn't specifically an Apple product on the back end but if you kind of read the smoke and look at the frameworks that have been announced year after year after year at the State of the Union, they're, they're very clearly moving in this direction. And it's it's really gotten very good. If you, if you think about what a small, sleek Apple device is going to need, it's going to be less like an Oculus with, you know, sensors placed all around the room. And it's going to be closer to the uh, Facebook uh, Oculus, um, the, the goggle the headset that reads it. Right, the Quest. Yeah. So the quest is great because you're not, oh, you're it's not tied, tied up, yeah. but it has the disadvantage of VR, which is so. What if the Apple goggles? This these are safety glasses. This is actually what I wear as part of my <laughs> shopping kit these days. But what if it? I mean, it, it, I think you would want Apple to do something stylish that looked like real spectacles, and presumably they uh, they would have prescription lenses in them. And, but and maybe Prosser said they were sleek. The ones sleek, seen were sleek. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I would wear if he, even if it looked like this, if it had a little apple on it, I'd wear it. I would. So, yeah. so Leo, yeah. one of the things about you wore the Google Glass—that's not any testimony at all, Michael. What if the <laughs> Go what, ahead, if the, the, what if the twenty twenty one date is aspirational? In other words, um, that uh, that the twenty twenty two date is kind of what they initially were shooting for and what they thought they could pull together. But looking at what is happening now and uh, with the virtualization of business and the virtualization of socialization. What if they're saying we need to get this out the door sooner now? And well, that, I, that this I will is, offer this is aspirational. I will offer an evidence an article from the information, which is also very well connected. Back in November, they uh, were talking about an all hands meeting at which Apple executives discussed a 2022 release for an AR headset and a 2023 release for glasses. But as you point out, Dwight, that was a long... November was a lifetime ago. <laughs> and a lot of things have changed. A yeah. lot. Yeah. And so the fatigue, you know, that we've all been talking about, uh, the desire for uh, something different in terms of the way people gather together online, 
may be driving Apple to say, let's see what we could do sooner rather than later. Here's what the information said, which would kind of confirm your thoughts, Brianna. Apple's headset, codenamed N301, will offer a hybrid of AR and VR capabilities. It resembles the Oculus Quest, a Facebook virtual reality headset released earlier this year, but with a sleeker, there's that sleek word, design. By the way, uh, as somebody in the chat room pointed out, when you have really good sources at a company like Apple, it often is the case that Apple is feeding you stuff that it wants to be kind of put out there. So the fact that Sleek has appeared now twice, it makes me a little suspicious. Cameras yeah. will be mounted on the outside of the device. Google Glass had a side camera on the temple, right? allowing people to see and interact with their physical surroundings. The Oculus Quest has cameras as well. In fact, Oculus, uh, Facebook came out with a way that you don't have to hold a physical device in your hand anymore. It can see your fingers with the cameras and it can tell what you're doing well enough that you don't need a device anymore. That's a huge improvement. Apple, according yeah. to the information, wants to make heavy use of fabrics and lightweight materials to ensure the device is comfortable to wear for extended periods of time. This was all a presentation at the Steve Jobs Theater in October. Filled the theater, a thousand people for internal though, intended for people working on this project. The headset will, so this is a, I would say a well-sourced leak. The headset will have a high resolution display that will allow users to read small type and see other people standing in front of and behind virtual objects. It'll be able to map surfaces. Apple's working on that, of course, with AR kit and its phones. Edges and dimensions of rooms with greater accuracy than existing devices on the market, executives said at the meeting. They were shown uh, at the meeting a recording of a demonstration in which a virtual coffee machine was placed on a real kitchen table surrounded by people in a room. The virtual coffee machine obscured people standing behind it. This is the ultimate Zoom machine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Apple. Now, this may be why the year 2021 comes up. Apple is planning to reach out to third-party software developers as early as 2021 to encourage them to build apps. Yeah. So in order to do that, uh, Brianna, wouldn't they have to have a prototype? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it will be like they did with the uh, the iMac Pro and the Mac Pro. Like you get the Apple ships you a device and it's got wires sticking out of it and you can't access it or look at it, but you can develop things on it. I imagine it will be something like that. Um, I, I do have to say, though, the one thing that gives me pause about this product is look at the, the really big feature on the last iPad Pro that came out. Um, you know, with the Magic Keyboard shipping, which is a fantastic product, um, it works with either the last gen iPad Pro or the one they just unveiled. And the one really big feature with that is the AR capabilities. If you look in the app store for AR apps and you're like, okay, what are they shipping that would justify me spending, you know, $1,200, $1,300 on a new iPad? Um, other than video conferencing, it really feels like most of the AR, you know, applications that they've come up with have been very niche. Uh, it's things like playing Lego games on tabletops or, you know, having a virtual tape measure to measure or, you know, shopping at Ikea and drawing like, uh, you know, furniture in your room. So I... I'm interested in this technology, and I think it certainly has some interesting game applications, but I do think it's very worthwhile noting that Oculus has not been able to really figure this out. Apple technology with AR to date and AR kit has not really been able to figure this out. It seems like a technology in search of a problem, if that makes sense. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. This is a different kind of ad uh, from ZipRecruiter. Uh, I'm just going to read their message verbatim because I think it's really, uh, it's touching. During this time of change, we want you to know that ZipRecruiter's focus has not changed. They're still doing what they've always done, helping people find work and helping businesses find the right people for their open roles. If you're looking for a job, ZipRecruiter's working with you to find the right job faster. They're dedicated to helping you get hired from caretaking to delivering foods and goods, to building medical facilities, supplying protective equipment, and so much more. In fact, ZipRecruiter's app will send you up-to-date job openings so you can be one of the first to apply. 
And if you're actively hiring, ZipRecruiter will invite candidates to apply to your most urgent roles, making it faster and easier to reach the people you need. By connecting people who need jobs and companies that need people, ZipRecruiter is working with all of us so we can keep moving forward. Let's work together. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. And boy, you know, I just personally couldn't be a better time for a company like ZipRecruiter. We're very grateful that they're around and that uh, they're part of our family. ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. Some of our best employees came to us from ZipRecruiter. And I know with two kids who just graduated from college and don't have great job prospects, having something like ZipRecruiter, and that both Abby and Henry are going regularly there, uh, to find jobs is a really, really huge resource. Uh, so the Quest-like device would be 2022. But then, as I said, the glasses would come out the following year. They're meant to be worn, according to Apple's presentation, they're meant to be worn all day, and current prototypes look like high-priced sunglasses with thick frames that house the battery and chips. This is the information quoting a person who's seen them. They've also patented a, 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 a use of lenses that darken when people are using AR on them as a way to let you know, oh, this person's not paying attention. He's looking at something. And Apple did that. That would be that. creepy. Yeah. That would be really creepy. You know, we've seen in science fiction all the time, people freeze. Yeah. Or they're yeah, right. staring in space. As a husband, so, I don't like that at all. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so keep in mind that Apple, when it was developing the iPhone and the iPad, started out doing the iPad. And then they said, you know, this would be better as a phone. Right. And they stopped. Right. And they switched to the phone. And then they came back to the iPad. Right. So, if you, again, if you're looking for an explanation of the discrepancies, you might think about that behavior uh, with the glasses. People, the um, Apple senior managers also told the uh, group they believe later versions of the glasses could replace iPhones in roughly a decade. And, of course, yeah. that's what Apple really – if. If I were running Apple, that's what you're looking for. What's the next iPhone? You had such a hit. The company was transformed by the iPhone. Th you would got to be yes. looking for the next thing because it's not going to last forever. How, are you, how do you keep up this growth? Do you, do you right. choose to level off and start declining? Or do you look for a, another thing that's even bigger than this cash cow, the iPhone? And I really think that this is a part of that. And, and you can always see where Google's going because they build some of the future technology into current products. And I don't think there's been enough attention given to, to something called the U1 chip, which is an ultra wideband chip in the iPhone. They're using it for almost nothing in the iPhone. You can basically, it, it will prioritize what you're going to do, uh, the sort of um, uh, airdrop, you know, sending airdrop. people airdrop file transfer, it'll prioritize it based on where you point the phone. That's a really trivial use for this <laughs> really advanced technology. I really think that chip is going into the glasses and and it will be able to identify the the pretty accurate location of things in your environment. And and the another thing to point out though is that we always think visually in terms of glasses. And of course there will be visual the whole point of it, it and is to have a visual frame of reference where you're capturing information, 3D information with these cameras, and you're also seeing things in your field of view. That's the whole point of augmented reality. But the other part of it is with glasses that you're wearing all day, you have an audio input that is not earbuds or something in your ears. It's something that will probably combine bone conduction with little speakers that enable you to be uh, receiving audio information all day long without discomfort. And if you look at all the audio-based things, uh, moving uh, Apple News to audio, doing all these different things, they know that audio is the future. And the best platform for delivering audio all day long without discomfort is a pair of glasses. And so the common, you know, the way Apple tends to do things is they take super advanced technology and they roll it out in a very basic way that really, really works right off the bat. So these Apple glasses at, at minimum are going to uh, work with their tile system to find your keys in the living room. You basically see something floating in 3D space. Those are my keys. There's my wallet. Uh, they'll have audio input. Um, that you can have all day. Siri will be talking to you uh, in, in, in whispering in your ear all day. Uh, also based on contextual information, 
it'll be able to get information from the environment with these sensors and then tell you things with Siri's voice uh, that will help you navigate your day, do walking directions, et cetera. So they'll pr the, the, the initial concept of uh, the glasses is not going to be some super advanced HoloLens type of thing. It's going to be a very basic, very solid, uh, practical uh, collection of, 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 of features uh, that will basically thrill people. And it'll use advanced technologies to do basic things. And I think that will be a very acceptable market. And it's also something they can or could do 2022, 2023. I think it's completely doable to do something like that. It, if you put together all the pieces of the of the puzzle, it does look like Apple's working towards something. The augmented reality in the iPhone, now in the LiDAR and the iPad, the AirBuds or AirPods. Uh, I mean, it feels like they're moving in this direction. You're right. News Plus being audio now. So it does Face feel ID. like they're putting this together. Face ID. But uh, you brought up the cautionary tale, Brianna, of Magic Leap. Right. I think we all, I think everybody here and everybody listening is excited by the notion of this science fiction thing, these augmented reality glasses. And uh, clearly Apple is trying to make it happen. Doesn't guarantee a success. And, and Magic Leap is a perfect example. What happened at Magic Leap, Brianna? I mean, so, you know, just to give listeners or viewers a little bit of background, you know, they had massive, massive venture capital cash. It was one of the biggest in the entire history of, uh, you know, launching companies. It was vaporware. We never saw a product. Eventually, they had um, this kind of alliance with uh, AT&T and brought this product out. And long story short, they did not have experiences that sold the product. So if you went to AT&T and said, I want to look at, at Magic Leap, I want to see if this is something worth buying or developing for, they didn't have anything that um, made consumers go, I want to go out and buy that. And Leah, this is what concerns me. Because when I look at the people I personally know that were laid off from Magic Leap this, this week and last week, they're not people without talent. They are AAA developers, very smart people in UI and animation. They know how to make good experiences objectively. And it, it this is what gives me pause, that if they have all of that money and talent sitting around, granted they don't have the Apple name, but if they couldn't make an experience that got Magic Leap to the next level, and Apple doesn't currently have anything in the App Store with their AR kit that makes me go, hey, I want to go buy a new iPad to take advantage of that. I, I'm just I'm, I'm fundamentally asking myself, what are we going to build with this that's going to get the public to go, you know, invest $1,000, $2,000 in a pair of glasses? Because that's a, that's a big ask. Dwight? <laughs> Well, your thoughts. So, you know, a lot. I keep going back to the description that Mike had of this world where people are avataring everywhere, and it's, you know, it strikes me it it may exist in the uncanny valley. That it's the kind of thing that techies think it would be really cool to do that, but that when you get it, put try to put this on the face of everyday people that um, it has to be so intuitive, so um, simple, and so realistic that uh, you don't mind. And I, that may be what happened with Magic Leap, is that there was too much computer science in the way of what, getting in the way of what they wanted to do. Um, Apple is better at making things human, but you still, you know, with some of the things that they do, you can still smell the computer science. And I worry that, um, that, you know, my people like Mike and I and Brianna and you want this, but that, um, everyday folks, uh, as Brianna said, are not going to want to shell out a thousand or two thousand dollars, uh, to live like that. Yeah. I think if they get, if they, if they can get it to do it, it will become the new normal. I, I think it will take off. It's just going to be difficult. You know, uh, Amy Webb, who's on this show regularly, uh, consulted with Magic Leap. She had tried the fancy Magic Leap, not the Magic Leap 1, the developer thing they put out. 
she's still a believer. Her thought was, the problem is you can't do a venture capital-based company to develop something like this. It's too long-term. It's too blue sky. And but Apple could. Well, that's the point. VC wants to turn around too quickly for this to have ever had have worked. This this really is something that should come out of a university. It should come out of a government, come out of a lab. It is blue sky R&D. There are very few companies, IBM, you know, uh, remember Bell Labs, that will put that kind of money into R&D. Apple's R&D spending historically used to be very, very low. Over the last five years, it's gone up and up and up and up and up. I think Apple's the kind of company that doesn't see this as a short-term VC-like investment. i sure they see some urgency uh, because they've sold everybody in the world an iPhone. There's nowhere else to go. So they need the next thing. But I also think that they have maybe more patience than the investors in Magic Leap had. So it doesn't... But you're right. It doesn't mean that they can do it. It just means that they have perhaps more stamina. And if anybody could do it. Yeah, if anybody could do it. Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody if could, could do it. Sort yeah. of, right. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. The difference is, though, if you're... If you have, if you're getting more venture capital than any other company, especially if you're based in Florida, uh, and you have to say, okay, we're going to take this new technology that we're developing and we're going to revolutionize science. It's going to be used by astronauts. We're going to recreate the world. You have to do that to justify the massive amounts of capital. You have to make a big play. Apple has to make a small play. If you look at the role of Airbuds in our lives. You know, we all used a Sony Walkman back in the day, except maybe Brianna. <laughs> um, and back in the day, when you put something I'm over guessing, your ears, I can see Brianna bopping down the avenue. I did. Her, I, did. Yeah, I, I don't know. Did you? Okay. <laughs> My dad okay. gave me his. So. <laughs> okay. So back in the day, you put things over your head because you were going to listen to an album, right? I mean, you were it's like, uh, I'm going to yeah. listen to music now. And you put on something over you. So so now how do people use their earbuds? They're controlling the audio. They're getting uh, notifications. They're interacting with Siri. They're playing music. They're doing calls. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Essentially, it's a way that enhances the phone, mostly. It, it takes all the stuff in your phone and it makes it much better. And I think that's what these glasses are going to do. It's going to do for the phone what the AirPods did for the phone, which is just give you another sense, another physical human sense to interact with your phone and its content better. You'll be able to control things in space. Instead of double tapping on your earbuds, you can swipe with, with, a, with an in-the-air gesture, for example. You'll get notifications when you hear the bleep bleep. You can just see it Oh, so and so is uh, you know i messaging me right now. Uh, that's better than pulling your phone out of your pocket. Uh, all of these things are not life changing revolutions. They are little things that feel really good. That's what Apple is going to do with these glasses. I think. I hope so. Um, I just I, I just want to say one of the reasons I believe VR failed is because. It, it's exactly like you're saying, Mike. We were we were thinking about ideas that didn't take advantage of the technology that we were aiming towards. VR, what we ended up doing is uh, funding a bunch of startups that were bringing ideas from the game industry right. instead of starting new ideas that were kind of from scratch. So Rubble Recall is a great example. It's a VR game. It's a fantastic game. It's made in Unreal Engine. It's a great immersive shooter. But even for someone like me that lives and dies by that kind of technology – I can only play it for 20 minutes and I get bored because it's taking an idea from the game industry that's really better on a PlayStation sitting yeah. in front of a TV. Yeah. So I think if this is going to be better, we need to be thinking about like mundane things too. Like what about someone working in a warehouse trying to find different things there or working in a data center, you know? swapping that out. That's a good application of AR or somebody at a courthouse trying to find records. I just, I think like we have this idea of a science fiction future. And I think when AR starts, it's going to be a lot more mundane. It's going to be like you said, Mike, like reading Apple news articles to you. <laughs> well, if you think about it, the Apple watch started really as just a sidecar to the phone and has slowly gained some stature. It's not quite a standalone device yet. 
But that is a gradual evolution that's taken it, what, five years? And I, uh, I could see, I, yeah, that's the thing. I think we all would love to get these glasses tomorrow. But it's not going to yeah. happen tomorrow. It's not going right. to happen in a but, year. It's not going to happen in five years. But I think the Apple Watch is a great example of what is likely with the with the the glasses. I mean, we were all kind of disappointed in the Apple Watch for the first right. year, two years, three right. years. Yep. And it gradually and when nobody was looking became like this fantastic wearable. It's really yep. great now. And it was just it just creeped. There was no big aha moment. It just sort of just got better and better and better. Yes. That's probably what's going to happen with the glasses. They're going to come out. We're all going to crap all over them <laughs> uh, it, you know they're, they're going to disappoint everyone and then over the next five years they're going to become amazing i should point out that apple acquired a company called next vr uh all that's on the next vr uh page now is next vr is headed in a new direction <laughs> but uh this was a platform for 3d virtual reality sports music and entertainment experiences and so it's an interesting acquisition for apple it fits perfectly in with what Apple's doing, except that Apple has no VR or AR. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So why did they buy these guys? Hmm. All right, let's take a little break. We got more to talk about, and I've got to figure out what that thing is behind Brianna. I don't know if that's. I don't. <laughs> it, I don't. What is? What that's you, my 3D printer. Oh, okay. It's my Lulzbot uh, Task Workhorse. That's your that task. Amazing. Oh. Yeah. You know, next time, could you have it printing something during the show? Or is it really I could, loud? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's not that fun. loud. Yeah, we'd be, <laughs> it'd give us something, you know, like we could watch it. Cook. It's like a cooking show. Slowly Can I tell you, my something? husband, he will whip up anything. He's so good in 3D. There was the, the TV back there. I wanted an Apple TV shelf for it. He just opened up Inventor Fusion and uh, 3D modeled me one last night. This printing on our other printer right now. See, I want, that's what I, if 3D printers would do that, <laughs> I would get one. <laughs> but mostly it seems like they're down for adjustment. Oh, yeah. It's really quirky. <laughs> <laughs> I want the power of a 3D printer without the hassle of a 3D printer. Yeah. I can think of a lot of things. I want to make face masks. I want to make, uh, you know, not, 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 not breathing masks. I'm already sewing those. I want one of those clear plastic shields. I want a face shield. You could throw something so like Bane. Like Bane. Like Bane. I have some 3D copper filament for this. There's a special medicinal uh, filament that came out, and Ooh. it's uh, bacteria and viruses won't stick to copper. It's what they use to to uh, sterilize it. So they came out with this filament, and Frank and I are waiting. He's a microbiologist. He has a PhD in microbiology, oh and God. we're going to print a face mask on that TAS workhorse, and then we're going to run a test with this filament and see, oh, okay, it says that God. things can't grow on it. Let's make sure that's true before we start printing these out it'd be like bane it'd be like right. a hard mask <laughs> i cannot get covid 19 go ahead and try i like it we're gonna have more with brianna Wu, former candidate for congress soon to be game developer once again or something or maybe yes. a lobbyist i think you should be a <laughs> lobbyist dwight silverman he's a tech burger i remember when dwight got out of the tech industry business for about 20 minutes yeah, yeah he's back baby back. and mike elgin he's not traveling that means we get more of him our digital yep. nomad at gastronomad.net and of course elgin.com this week i gave away my bitcoin wallet previously on twit but hello everybody welcome to who wants to be a bitcoin air what type of animal was seen being Dramatic. Chipmunk. Chipmunks are so small. No, it was like like this. <laughs> <laughs> How did it do it? Do it again. Do it again. Show you one more time. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Twit events. Evan A. Barr, this goes back to our conversation about uh, voting. He said we can bank online with security. How is voting more difficult than online banking? We need voting to be universal, and online banking is not. Right. You're extending the security infrastructure of online banking in a universal way. Why can't you do that? Hands-on photography. It is part two of our shelter-in-place time-lapse photography and video tutorial. Oh, that's cool. All about Android. We talk with Brandon Belinsky, who's the product manager for YouTube Music, about the YouTube Music, Google Play Music 
integration. You know, YouTube Music is is a great premium audio service. It's ready for Play Music users to come over. And, uh, you know, we launched the one tap to transfer experience that moves all your content over. Twit. I got your Bitcoin right here. <laughs> I should mention there's one little catch. I'll be glad to send you the wallet file, but I forgot the password. Let's see. Great. Let's see Just like can... all of us. <laughs> if you can crack it, <laughs> there is a significant amount of money in there. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's uh, more than seven Bitcoins in there. but <laughs> So I won't say who won, but it was a really fun contest. You can go, where is it on the feeds? It's on YouTube, right? YouTube.com slash twit. You can watch our, this is part of, we, every Friday now we do twit after hours. I hope we keep doing this after this is over because it's so much fun. We've done the match game. We've done ask me anything. We've done trivia. Uh, we'd love to have you guys on uh, future ones. Uh, we're bringing all sorts of people on. And uh, this time we did Who Wants to Be a Bitcoin Heir? <laughs> and I, I gave away my, se my seven plus Bitcoin wallet. But it's no good to anybody because I don't know the password. I can't remember it for the life of me. I've been, but maybe the winner, and I won't say who because I don't want no spoilers, but the person who won it has some significant technical skills. Maybe they can, you know, do a brute force or something. And in a few years, they might be a, a Bitcoin heir. I don't so know. Leo, what's. Why don't, why don't you do a for uh, uh, the after hours show? Do a serious, deep computer history trivia game. Ooh. Get uh, Harry McCracken on there. Get <gasps> me on a, there. That's a great get some, idea. Get some folks who've been around. Get for some a long old time. timers See? on. Yeah, serious. Yeah. Jerry Pornell's yeah, ghost. I do it. Yeah, Jerry Mike, Pornell's you've been around a while. Ghost. Get Jerry Pornell's yeah, right. Go. That's right. a great idea. Done. We will do that. Old timer. Right. Tech trivia. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> Serious. Some Because we did tech trivia in this Who Wants to Be a Bitcoin Air? But, you know, it wasn't the hardest tech trivia ever. There were some, but, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Some of the really tough tech trivia. Are you pretty good at that, Dwight? You think you know that? Uh, I think so. It's You know, I let's just put it this way. I used to know a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem, right? That's right. That is the problem. The older the trivia, the more you've forgotten. <laughs> Actually, what you should do is get Harry to do the questions because, you know, in terms of like Mr. Computer well, History. He's been doing yeah. some really good pieces at Fast Company. What was his yes. his most recent article? What was it? It was really good. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I can't remember, but I'll I'll find it. But he's he does such a good job and he does a lot of that computer history here's one how the telephone failed its big test during the 1918 spanish flu pandemic we'll get some of those questions there on for the yeah there we for go the, i remember that for the old i made timers. the mistake of uh saying something negative about the uh, trs-80 oh. <laughs> he was talking about mentions just like <laughs> well okay don't, to be fair that trash 80 around uh, that was around the Harry. computer oh, oh he's gonna oh no you're you're you're, no, you're harry trouble, loves no? his stuff <laughs> that was the computer that if you um wore house slippers and slid your feet along the carpet before you sat down on it you could kill it you could literally yes. kill it with a static shock. It was like, that's it. I don't work anymore. So and there were a few people. <laughs> a few people. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Right, we'll do that. Uh, we do those every Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Our Twit After Hours. It's turned out to be one of the most uh, enjoyable things we do. It's a lot of fun. Uh, let me do one more ad. Then I do want to get to, uh, I want to get to Unreal Engine 5. Yes. Because I know you're excited about that, and I am too. In fact, we'll show some of the video uh, that Tim Sweeney unveiled. He said some interesting things about the PS5, including this this new PlayStation 5 is so good, PC makers are going to learn a lot about how to make PCs. Very interesting. Our show brought to you by LinkedIn Learning. You know I love LinkedIn Learning. For a long time, we were using lynda.com, and I did all, and I have so many friends who were teachers, experts. They did great classes. Uh, LinkedIn bought them and they've turned it into LinkedIn Learning and now it's just grown. It's gotten better and better. The platform is so good for education. 16,000 courses taught by the best in the business, the best industry experts. You can learn skills like how to master working from home. We're all dealing with that. Entrepreneurship foundations, how to be a resilient leader, 
there are some amazing, I mean, 16,000 courses to choose from. I know lots of folks, many of the people you've seen on our shows who are LinkedIn learning uh, professors, I don't know, educators. There's also stuff, there's soft skills like 10 ways to stay motivated while job hunting. I sent that one off to my kids. Uh, things like managing in difficult times. Yeah, that's a class. And one of the things I love about LinkedIn Learning, you get custom-tailored course recommendations, you get project files, you get quizzes. They're really interactive. You really get to practice what you learn. It's really, it's really learning, and that's why they call it LinkedIn Learning. Courses are available, of course, anytime, anywhere, on your computer, on your phone. You get a certificate when you complete the course, perfect for framing or putting up on your LinkedIn profile. And by the way, we've been doing this for years. We offer LinkedIn Learning to our team. Because we want them to get skills. We want them to learn new things, to grow, to expand. It's the best way to learn and apply new skills, just to grow our business. And because we know when our team members get more skills, it helps us. You'll learn from the best in the business. You'll connect with a global network of experience. And you'll do it on your own time for fun. Get LinkedIn learning for your team. Keep learning the skills you need to rise to the occasion. Try one month free at linkedinlearning.com slash twit. linkedinlearning.com slash twit. That one month will be great, too. You're gonna, this is a perfect time. You got a month, I bet. You got a little time on your hands? linkedinlearning.com slash twit. So, um, should, so t first of all, before I show video of it, Unreal Engine is used all the time at all so many games. It's not just mm -hmm. Unreal, right, Brianna? Right. Well, yeah, it's we have a lot of different uh, engines in the game industry. There's Frostbite, there's Unity. But Unreal in particular is very exciting because it's used beyond the game industry. If you saw uh, the Star Wars movie Solo, uh, you saw Unreal Engine used for a lot of the special effects there. It's just a remarkably... Um, agile uh, 3D engine that's really, really good at uh, cinema. So uh, people use it in television pipelines. It's just, um, it's a it's a Swiss army knife of 3D uh, work. And I was asking you, uh, how do you work in Unreal Engine? How, is it coding? Uh, well, it's a little bit of everything. Um, so uh, you, you have the Unreal Editor with Unreal 4, and you can install it on PC or Mac. Um, if you're designing 3D assets, you can bring something in from Maya or Max or Blender and put it in FBX and import it. Um, you know, you can certainly code, uh, or if you don't want to learn to code, you can just use uh, visual nodes. They have an entire visual scripting language called Blueprint, which is excellent. Uh, many games that are shipped with Unreal Engine don't have a line of written code in them. It's really? just people hooking blueprint nodes together. No it's a kidding. really, it's a very, very, um, it's a really good language. And in fact, with the last game I shipped, I know, you know, C++ really well, but I ended up working in their visual scripting language because it was faster. And we were trying to ship a very complicated game on iOS devices. So, so Unreal Engine is awesome. Before the show, we were talking about, uh, I was showing you some Minecraft stuff the kids have done. We've got a bunch of 17-year-olds mm -hmm have their own Minecraft worlds and they're doing a lot of design. And you said that's the kind of skill, those kids have the kind of skill that they could then go to something like Unreal Engine and design yep. real games. It's, it's Absolutely. That's really interesting. And so there's oh, a whole anything, generation. What they're doing is more complicated because they're having to design the static meshes. Like with Unreal Engine, it's just you go into Content Manager and drag the door, the wall, the box, you know, whatever there, and then do the lighting for it. So they're actually doing something that's harder. That's interesting. Yeah. And it's free. Uh, well, it's free to a point. Uh, Unreal Engine 5 that's coming out uh, will be free up to a million dollars, at which point that's you'll fine. have to pay royalties. I'll pay yeah, royalties after the first million. I'm okay with that. Well, my last license for Unreal Engine, like if we wanted to put C++ code in it, we had to write Epic a check for, I believe it was $30,000. So wow. this is a much better deal for many people. That's great. So, yeah. and, and does Epic Games do this for the money? 
Well, uh, my, you know, uh, uh, was the Fortnite has become so popular that they've got tons they've got the of money. Cash. Yeah, Tim Sweeney yes. made seven billion dollars yes. himself last year. Right, right. Thanks uh, to yeah, Fortnite. they're really pushing the Epic Store. Um, so there was an announcement this week: the Unreal Engine Five is coming out with just a breathtaking demo, and it, it got a lot of attention. Let's take a look. Industry. We've got some of that video. Tell me what uh, is this? Is the Epic uh, uh, instead of GDC? They just did a video. Right. So tell me what is new in this. There, is it lighting? So it is lighting. So if you look at this, um, oh my God. look at the number of, we call them tries in the, the game industry, uh, basically the number of vertexes on all of this. When they get very close, you're not just going to see the lighting. You're going to be able to really, really make out every single point of on these so statues. all of this stuff is really a combination of polygons, often right. triangles. That's why I call them tries. So, right. But so you, look at that rock right there. That looks like I don't see any triangles. That's amazing. Right. Well, traditionally in a game, if you looked at something like a rock, we've we've come up with ways to fake it with normal mapping, which basically puts a two D image over a three D object put a texture and on top fake of it. depth. Yeah. yeah. Well, it fakes depth and makes the engine render it in a way that looks deeper. What they found out how to do here is to render so many tries with this statue that it just looks unbelievably realistic. Um, and the the thing that is exciting for game developers like me is rather than having to go through and optimize every single statue to have a low poly, a medium poly, a high poly, an ultra high poly, this new engine is going to do it all dynamically, which has a lot of applications, not just for PlayStation games, but for VFX, for, for television logos, for, for everything. So Look, it's really I mean, exciting. I feel like I'm at Petra Jordan. I mean, you could recreate real world stuff. This is... yeah. Truly mind-boggling. Look at that dynamic lighting. That is so computationally intense. So That's what ridiculous. they're doing is moving the light source, and then it figures out what it looks like on each try as it's going through the scene. That's exactly right. If you look at a video game, you'll notice that shadows and lighting will affect your character, a skeletal mesh, but it's not going to affect the environment around you beyond shadows. So this is a way of doing it. That's it's dynamic lighting. It's, is it it's ray much, tracing? much deeper. Ray tracing is I if I recall correctly, it's not in this demo yet. Uh, but we're we hope to have that soon. Because you're starting to get ray tracing now in some hardware. Right. Right. Uh, wow. Look at this. This part is what is absolutely stunning. And even the person looks pretty darn real. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's always that uncanny valley with the characters in these games. Right. So, for some reason, they can make, you know, rocks. Yeah, I feel like we're in Petra. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah the number of tries that's computing is just mind boggling. What kind of hardware, yeah. though? This must be running on right. a supercomputer, right? Right. That was my question. If I remember correctly, um, this is this is targeted for the PlayStation 5. So I don't think the video, and you'll look this up, but as I recall, this is something that could run dynamically on a normal PlayStation 5, but it was pre-cooked ahead of time. So it's footage in development from an engine that's in development. Wow. I've got to buy a PlayStation 5. <laughs> will the Xbox Series X, the, their competitor, both coming out at the end of the year, will that have similar capabilities? or? Well, I imagine Unreal will eventually run on it. The thing I love about Unreal is you can create a game once and then right. you can port it to Android, you can port it to Mac, you can port it to PC, you can port it to you know, even Switch in some cases. So um, it's a very versatile Swiss Army knife. So complex. We've needed this to greatly improve our animation system. Really incredible. And look at the birds and the predictive foot placement and the lighting. The God. lighting is amazing. IK and body position. Look at the, the way the scarf is flowing. Like that's yeah. I mean it's older technology, but that's physics on that particular scarf and the way the the um you know the bone structure inside of it is floating around. So that I mean if you think oh, about look the, at this. the calculations involved are phenomenal. Well, they figured out how to optimize it. But, I mean, something like this just could not be done on a PlayStation 4. It would be impossible. If, so, If yeah. you read the uh, Carmack's book about the early days of, of Id, the, the techniques that he had to use to make Doom <laughs> yep. even vaguely playable, I mean, there was a lot of trickery involved. Yeah. Uh, yep. 
And that was Something. partly because the processors weren't that good. But I think that there is still algorithmically a lot of magic going on here. Yeah. What's what's exciting about this for developers is if I was trying to do something like this in Unreal Engine 4, I would have to spend a week on every one of these statues. I would have to go into ZBrush with that particular shield and create custom normals and spectral maps. They've What they've focused on is the pipeline here for developers. So I would be able to take that high poly asset directly from, uh, from ZBrush, bring it into Unreal Engine, and then like you're – you know, like your kid making a Minecraft level, just drag and drop Holy that into cow. the scene. And Holy then it would cow. do that. This is what they're saying, that it will do all that work for me beneath the hood. So is it just ZBrush? Will it work with Blender or other 3D? Yeah, it, it would work with other 3D programs, wow. but something this detailed is done in ZBrush. So, yeah, it's if this if what they're saying is true, this is going to really cut down on the amount of time it takes games to create things that are visually stunning. Right. And you can see why Epic is doing this because these games will probably be on the Epic. A lot of them will be on the Epic platform and they sell them. Correct. They have an Epic store. Uh, they just want, you know, a, a Fortnite every year is all we ask. <laughs> Which is funny because Fortnite is very low poly. <laughs> oh, I know. It's not anything. interesting, yeah. isn't it? It's not challenging. Did they, was that an aesthetic decision or is that a decision based on the fact that you're going to have a lot of players, a lot of things to calculate? I mean, you, you try and make games like that for a wide, wide, wide audience. Like oh, World of Warcraft is like that as yes, well. Of yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, this is just stunning stuff. But that's one advantage of having a, a platform like the PlayStation 5 that's so dominant. Yep. That you can say, well, I know there's going to be a million players out of the box ready to yep. buy my game. Yeah. I'll tell you what, after looking at this, I can't wait to get one. That's Will it, will it look like this out of the... I mean, it's not even out yet, right? Well, well, the, well, the one thing is, you know, if you talk to Amazon about, you know, their lumberyard technology, they will swear up and down that it's great, it's amazing. I mean, the company is going to tell you their product is great. So Everybody can do I want, this. Right. I want to see developers look at this and evaluate yeah. the pipeline. I certainly will when I can get my hands on it. But, you know, Epic... I can say this. I've worked with them a lot. They've always been a very honest company with me. Their support has always been excellent, and they're a very developer-focused company. So I've, from my experience, I have no reason not to believe what they're saying is true. Just to be clear, is this uh, pre-rendered or, in other words, is it like a cutscene? They kept saying interactive. It looks like it's being played. Right. It would be something like that would be done on the fly in the game. Even cutscenes are not pre-baked. I mean, nowadays they are being rendered in the engine. It's just playing straight through. Really? Yeah. Wow. Generally, yeah. They don't render them ahead of time to make them look better, huh? They do some of them, but yeah. generally speaking, most cutscenes and games are using the engine dynamically, is which is the, why, yeah. Is this the best engine out there now? I, I think we'll have to look at it and tell, but I've spent my career learning Unreal Engine, so I feel very strongly about it. <laughs> uh, wow. Wow. Uh, we're going to, uh, it's just in the nick of time when we get the second wave of quarantine in place for the year 2021, <laughs> we'll have a great game machine uh, to play with it. Was that uh, Tomb Raider or is it just kind of a random? Uh, just a random new IP that they real. were playing yeah. with. Wow, really interesting. Guys, G G Dwight, you don't play video games, do you? Are you a big Fortnite player? No, I did a long time ago. I was kind of a big Doom Quake. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. And but I but I I just ran I don't have the time to do that anymore and and now um I would get, you know, my butt handed to me. My handle was the Llama King, which should tell you <laughs> how how bad I was. You really kicked the llama's butt, did you? <laughs> That's it. Uh, yes, the other way around. Uh, so I played a lot of Unreal when it first came out, oh, and yeah. that was 20 years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. It and was. that looked amazing for its time. It was mind-boggling. Yeah. I remember. So NASA, NASA uses Unreal uh, to develop uh, training for astronauts. I did a story about virtual reality at NASA several years ago. And one of the things, they, they have a lab where they essentially train astronauts what to do if they get in trouble on a spacewalk. And I got to use their simulator with VR where I was 
essentially standing out on the edge of the arm on the space station, the robotic arm. Oh, that's and, cool. And uh, it was incredible. And, and they they use uh, Unreal. Some of them, some of the other simulations use Unity, but it was incredibly impressive. Yeah. The thing I like about Unreal is the cinematic scripting uh, part of it. Like if you're looking to do cinematic scripting, they've just um, – it, they really invented the the the, the interactive cutscene in 3D in games in a way that was very accessible for developers. So you know, they've literally been working on that part of the engine since 1998, and they've gotten to be very good at it. Yeah, yeah, 98. I remember uh, on the screensavers set, we built what we called at the time the ultimate gaming machine, which had a CRT <laughs> monitor that was... <laughs> like 800 pounds and it was it was a widescreen monitor which in those days was probably this uh but we played a lot of unreal and it, it blew, blew my mind then because i had played doom which was you know go back and look at the original doom pretty gritty and then quake we loved quake and then unreal came out and it was like this how are they doing this it's amazing uh let's take a little break mike do you want to talk about gaming i, I left you out no Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a workaholic, Leo. I don't play games no, at all. No, I know. But I, in fact, I love games. I've, I've been a gamer my whole life, but I don't have the time or the patience anymore. That's and it, the problem. It takes a real, a lot yeah. of devotion, especially yep. now with these young kids. You go and you, you start Call of Duty and you're dead. You know, I played Fortnite. I loved it, but I died. I was like, there's 100 people go in, Leo goes out. It's like it was over before it even began. So, uh, can I say that that's not your fault? That's the game industry's fault. In the last 10 years, we've shifted towards a game design that is, um, it is designed to bring you in for massive amounts of time right. to give you a huge learning curve and to keep you hooked as long as possible. I love games that you can go beat in five to 10 hours and we just don't ship those anymore. So that's not your fault, Leo yeah. and Mike. That's, the last game I loved and uh, finished, I think was Bioshock infinite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you could finish that in a reasonable yeah. amount of time. And, uh, and I, and I also love, but did not finish Skyrim. Uh, because those are such vivid worlds and they were unique and interesting worlds. They were more, it was yeah. more than just how many people can you, how many kills can you rack up in five minutes? There was really a story and there was, and there was, you'd go around a corner and something interesting was happening. And yeah. I would love to see more games like that. I remember thinking when Bioshock Infinite came out, well, that's that. <laughs> that's, that's Unreal that's that. Engine, by the way. Is Bioshock it? Infinite. Yeah. Yep. Amazing, isn't it? Um, and, but I, you know, I look at Unreal Engine. I think we're going to see a lot of things besides games coming out of this. So, so you know, as you said, NASA and uh, uh, you know, I could see travel. I could see all sorts of interesting uses. For Hollywood, it. Hollywood, yeah, yep. yeah. Military uses it for training, for safety training. So. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Deep fake videos, <laughs> political propaganda. Just think, <laughs> yeah, just think what you could do with it. Our show today brought to you by Extra Hop. Just think what you could do with Extra Hop with more and more companies going remote. The cyber criminals are out there. They're ready to take advantage of the changing IT reality. More important than ever for organizations to know what's going on in their enterprise. And I don't just mean your local area network or even your wide area network. I mean your cloud. I mean IoT devices. Employees are at home Remember when uh, somebody brought a Raspberry Pi into NASA and it brought the whole thing down? Now it's the opposite. You're bringing NASA to your Raspberry Pi. You're in people's houses. That's why you need Extra Hop in order to protect and scale your business because that's how Extra Hop started with performance monitoring. You need more than just visibility. You need fast, reliable information about threats, about remote access problems. And when you get that information, you need it in the context that helps you act and fix the problem right away. That's Extra Hop. It helps you detect threats and performance issues up to 95% faster and respond 60% more efficiently. You're going to get complete visibility on every asset in your enterprise. And that's in real time. In fact, Go to the Extra Hop site, extrahop.com slash twit, and take a look at the dashboard. They have a demo dashboard. You will be blown away. You'll say, how do I get this? I want this now. 
I want I want to see every asset in real time at scale now. You can secure your hybrid enterprise wherever it is today, wherever it goes tomorrow, automatically detect new rogue and unmanaged IoT devices, see everything in your environment from the cloud to the data center all the way down to the customer. Extra Hop is awesome. It keeps your business safe and available at any scale. Look at that. Wizards of the Coast, they use Extra Hop. They use it to support and uh, secure their AWS cloud. At Wizards of the Coast Chief Architect Dan McDaniel said there's no other company that aligns to supporting our DevOps model, the speed, the lack of friction, than Extra Hop. He loves it. The Home Depot uses it. Now, Home Depot's got 2,300 remote sites. They've got point of sale. They've got a massive security challenge. They use Extra Hop to manage and secure those remote sites. And this is the quote, no data set is more complete and accurate than what Extra Hop delivers. If you need that information, if you need the threat detection, if you have performance issues, if you are anxious to respond quickly to anything happening to your network, you can take control of your cloud and your cloud security right now with Extra Hop. Get tips on securing and supporting remote access. And then, honestly, you got it is so cool. Check out the full product demo at extrahop.com slash twit. But I got to warn you, as soon as you see it, you're going to say, why don't we have this? Extrahop.com slash twit. These guys are great. Great product. And, uh, you know, in a way, this show has really been all about how cool technology is and how cool it's getting. And I think so many, so many times we, we kind of we get jaded and complacent. And we go, oh, it's all a mess. There is amazing stuff going on out there. And the kind of visualizations you can get with Extra Hop, that's a perfect example. I almost want to just, let's talk about good stuff. Let's make this the positive episode of Twit. We've had enough uh, negative episodes of Twit. I want to talk about the, the good things, like the uh, University of California college graduation that in Minecraft that they built. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Um I think a lot of companies are saying Twitter just announced they're going to let employees work at home forever. Employees love it. They're, it sounds like they're expanding the hours that they expect people to work. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> you cynical Never person. Never stop working, ever. <laughs> you know, it's kind of yeah, funny because I've been, I've been uh, advocating <laughs> remote work for for forever, uh, for for decades, twenty you, years. That's now. what you do. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And and and. There's always been this resistance. Oh, it can't be done, can't be done. And now everybody's doing it and people are saying, hey, you know, that really could have been an email. This is like totally working. Um, that's that's one of the reasons why I've been so anti-Zoom because Zoom is kind of taking away some of the benefits of remote work, which is that you can focus, you can control your environment to, to a certain extent. But once people are actually working remotely without their kids being at home and schools canceled and without all these Zoom meetings all day, it's going to really enhance productivity. The other thing that I think is really interesting for, for this show is that a lot of people in Silicon Valley are saying, why are we here paying these prices? Right. Dealing with this traffic. They don't have when, to. If we're, if we're going to be from home, our home could be anywhere. And so why don't we go live in a cabin? Why don't we go live abroad? Why don't we live in a small town? And this is really, I think, going to change the dynamics of cities. Uh, Probably not great for the cities, but probably great for the lifestyle that uh, people, especially people lucky enough to work in tech and and other kinds of uh, industries where you can work remotely, uh, work. And, and I think it's going to be a massive transformation. It's really an accelerant of a trend that was already inevitable. I think we've just leap, leapt forward 10 years in terms of how many people are going to be working from home. I have a different opinion on this. Um, you know, after Gamergate, I worked with Twitter quite a bit to update their policies and to figure out what happened and to stop things like that from happening again. And when I've gone to Twitter and I've seen in person the kinds of alliances and friendships that people have as they've tried to navigate this giant corporation with a lot of different competing departments with different goals. I've seen firsthand the value of being able to bring someone down to the cafeteria to hang out and to talk to someone 
about a point of view that they hadn't considered. And I think even if you widen that out from from just Twitter, I do think that in person has value. Um, does that mean that every single company moving forward needs to spend a huge amount of money paying for San Francisco real estate? No, of course not. But I I do think that there's something that gets lost when you move to 100% virtual, especially in engineering teams. If you talk to uh, Matt Mullenweg, who uh, is the founder of WordPress Runs, parent company is Automatic. He has a podcast called Distributed, uh, and he's kind of a big evangelist for distributed work. He will tell you that you do need to have uh, in-person gatherings, Automatic does a uh, an annual all hands meeting, but they don't have to meet at their headquarters. They don't have a headquarters. They meet at, at whatever cool location in the world they want to go to. Ooh, that's cool. Uh, but they, but for them, that's important. And I agree with Brianna. I think uh, I think what we'll see is maybe a, a kind of a hybrid uh, thing that will happen. I mean, I can see here at the Chronicle, you know, we are all working remotely. I can see us maybe not necessarily always coming back to the newsroom every day, but maybe a couple of times a week we're in the newsroom. And I think that, uh, I, I think you're going to see kind of a combination. It's always been, you also have, go ahead, uh, Mike. You, you, you also have to consider the fact that working from home is really something that is or is not amenable to your personality. So those, right. you know, some of us are, uh, self-driven introverts who are self-directed and we need time to think and we need control of our own thought process. Lots of other people uh, get a lot more energy and ideas from being around other people and interacting and so on. And so I think the, the best case scenario is that the work from home situation reflects not just some blanket c company policy, but actually reflects the preferences of individual personalities so that the people who really thrive working from home can do so and the people who really thrive in an office environment can do that. One, one ironic uh, slow-moving catastrophe is that several major Silicon Valley companies, specifically Facebook but also Google, just invested gazillions of dollars in these massive open office uh, plans. Facebook in particular has the world's largest open office in, in Menlo Park. And just as soon as they had that up and running for a year or two, along comes a virus that is spreads like mm. wildfire in an open office. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of an ironic thing that companies are going to have to deal with. Even those Silicon Valley companies and elsewhere, they're going to have to figure out how to sort of wall people off to a certain extent uh, because Facebook like open offices are not going to fly in a world of global pandemics. Microsoft used to always have an office, have offices, right? They, I don't think Microsoft embraced open offices unless they have more recently. Yeah. But all yeah. the new guys, I mean, look at Apple's campus, you know, that's all open. And I, I do agree with you, Brianna, that, that I, I feel like, for instance, Twitter is a really good example. The Twitter was in the South Park of San Francisco and a bunch of startups started up around that because they, they would see each other, they'd run into each other, they'd have lunch together. And there was this collegial aspect that was one of the reasons San Francisco had such a great startup scene uh, is because everybody was there. And there is something to be said for that. Steve Jobs famously in the new Apple campus initial and in the initial design only had uh, one bathroom per floor. <laughs> So, because he wanted people to all kind of run into each other as they walked a mile and a half to get to the bathroom. I hope they didn't have an open office plan inside the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, right, I think right. They, I think they better, uh, saner minds talked him out of it. But initially, he really wanted, like, we don't want so many bathrooms. We, I mean, I, that's typical Steve, right? Here's right. the guy who used one, to wash one. his feet in the toilet. So, I, you know, who knows what Steve is <laughs> yeah, thinking. But, but and think that was about his, this that was for a company show. like Twitter <laughs> that is really, they've had some tough problems, right? right? Like Gamergate happened at Twitter because, let's just really be honest here, it was a bunch of white dudes that designed it and they, they didn't, didn't think it. about harassment right. and didn't invest in trust and safety. And they had to have hard conversations and redo features and they tried slapping band-aids on it. And I can tell you for a fact, there are people at Twitter that put everything on the line to improve it. And Twitter today is a drastically better product today than it was during Gamergate. I don't, I, I'm, I'm unsure 
how effective that advocacy could have been in an all work from home situation. Maybe it could have. I don't know. My husband's work, you know, he does patent law for a living. His job is barely affected. In fact, it's easier for him to write patents without all the meetings. Sure. But sure. I just, I, I wonder, I, th- I could see it working better for a company that's more static in what they produce or is that that's smaller. But when you get to the size of a big company, you invariably have people with competing goals, different agendas, different cultures. And I think I think some of that clash has to happen in person. Yeah. So do you think going back to our original conversation that these virtual reality glasses and the and the 3D mapped skeletal frame would help that or is it not yeah. enough it would no i do there was a back before i decided to run for office there was a vr tech i was looking at they had eye tracking with it so right. for um for the skeletal mesh i would look at if i was looking over here and you look at it, then the eyes would turn and look you dead in the eye it was such a oh, emotionally weird. connective yes. effect yes yes that it, it produced something so i i do think it could have very good um, I think it could help build that human connection. How interesting. Yeah. There, in fact, Twitter itself said that one of the reasons, you know, they were able to get out of their fail wheel situation was that the, the, their, their engineers would talk to other engineers at other startups in the area that were trying to figure out how to scale. And, they, and the information shared that way actually helped them become a more scalable product. So there is, there's a lot to be said for collegiality. But unfortunately, most of us in the computer industry are introverts and very happy <laughs> at home <laughs> writing up our patents. One last story. I want this <laughs> from uh, it's uh, it's from the Stuff May Hear YouTube channel. It is uh, Shane Whiten's robotic basketball hoop. You, <laughs> this I, this is what this is what happens when nerds are locked in the house. For a lengthy period of time, if you can't shoot hoops, well, you could get a Raspberry Pi to make sure that every single basket goes in. Thank you, Shane. Love this. This is what I need for sure. Mike Elgin, I'm sorry that you're stuck in the United States, but I guess you're having a good time with Princess Squishy Face and the fam. And, uh, Quick thing, you said you wanted to talk about positive things. This is uh, we've been fermenting everything. Wow, this is blurry. It's, you okay. got the Skype blur uh, on. That's why it can only yeah, your nose yeah. is in focus. Okay, <laughs> so this is actually something my wife just made. This is tapache. This is fermented pineapple <gasps> rind. Oh, uh, so this is a this is actually a, a a an Aztec drink. They used to make it with corn, and when the Spanish started bringing in pineapples to Mexico, they started making it with pineapple. But it's it's pineapple rind with water and pilloncillo. You let it sit around for a week or two, and it becomes this delicious alcoholic beverage. OMG. Yeah, it's so good. So try it. If you're going to uh, cut open a pineapple, just take the, the peel, just throw it in a jar, put some water in there and some sugar, and it will ferment on its own using the microbes that are on the I pineapple. I think we're all learning uh, how important fermentation is. <laughs> I mean, yes, I yes. ferment all the things. I've got my yes. little sourdough starter. It's bubbling away. This is this is uh, the, the COVID-19 fermentation class. Fermentation That's right. is life. <laughs> it so, is. So, somebody mentioned that it was like a conspiracy among the microbes. It, it was uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, the coronavirus was there to get us all to use these other microbes. I love that. <laughs> so, so you put the just the pineapple rind in there with some sugar. She's using what? Some special sugar. Pilloncillo, the, the, the Mexican sugar. And you, you could also use brown sugar. Unrefined so, sugar she's sugar. using. But, uh, exactly. and, then, and then how long does it take to ferment? Anywhere between probably three or four days to, I don't know, a couple of weeks. She did this for three weeks. If you no. keep going, it becomes something that they call uh, in Central America, they call it chiche, which is a highly alcoholic. Um, this still has some sugar in it, so so it's, it's still sweet. sweet. Yeah. So if you if you let the the fermentation devour all that sugar, it's going to convert that into alcohol, right. and you're going to have a, a drinking problem. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> or an opportunity. Options. That's the beauty of fermentation. <laughs> yeah. You can you know you can I can quit any time. And <laughs> right. It won't, but you could. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Elgin. Uh, Elgin dot com is his website. Subscribe to his newsletter, full of wild and fun stuff. Yes. I love the things you're finding uh, at Mike Elgin on Twitter. 
It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, give my love to Kevin and the gang and Princess Pleasure's Bushy all Face and Amira and miss you all. I'll tell you what, if there's one group miss of people too, I'd want to hang out with right now, it'd be you guys. Thank you. The living it be easy. Yeah. Uh, Dwight Silverman, he is at the Houston Chronicle at the Tech Burger, HoustonChronicle.com slash Tech Burger. What else are you doing these days? Well, I have a newsletter that I launched. I think I just launched it when you uh, did. I think I was last on. Yep. It's uh, called Release Notes. It's every Monday morning. You can get it at HoustonChronicle.com slash Release Notes. And it is uh, the most in, in newsletter world, what you want to do is you want to have your newsletters be opened in the email rather than just sit as a header. And I'm really happy that Release Notes is the most opened newsletter at the Chronicle. Nice. So, um, yes. Yeah, I'm really nice. pleased with that. And in fact, I finished it just while I was waiting to connect to you guys. I was finally finishing it. I had rushed over here and I had like two more stories to write. And so I did them while I wasn't connect, wasn't able to connect to you. Perfect. So I appreciate the delay. Yes, perfect. <laughs> you see, you're so efficient. We don't need to go to work. We could just, we'll do it all from home. That's right. Bri Brianna Wu's got a new toy. I know she's anxious to get to her 14 core. How many cores? 14 core iMac. 14 uh, iMac core. Oh. I got that. I got that. So CDW is canceling. Uh, they have corporate customers. They're canceling tons of orders. I have a friend of mine that works with them. So that machine, if you bought that new from Apple, that would cost you about $7,500. I got it for $5,800, believe wow. it or not. Oh. You're going to love it. I, my main machine is a uh, – <laughs> John, I put up the CDW site because I was hoping she was going to say you could buy it, but it turns out she has a friend. I have a friend, yes. <laughs> <laughs> John's saying, let's see, where is it? I, I want to uh, – but I love my iMac Pro. That is my go-to machine, and I know they have a newer Mac Pro with more cores and more power and stuff. Mm -hmm. That iMac Pro is a very, very sweet machine, and I have two cinema displays running off it, so it's a three. I The only Whoa. thing – I'm very jealous because Lisa has the biggest freaking monitor I've ever seen. It's like a, it's a, a the arm span. It's like a six, it's like 57 inch curved. It's crazy. The thing is, because I have an iMac, I can't really do that. And I kind of almost wish I could. But I do love that iMac. It's a beautiful. So you have two of the the Thunderbolt displays, the old 24 inch no. Apple. No, yeah. So one of them's Thunderbolt and one of them's uh, DisplayPort, or maybe Thunderbolt two. I can't remember. Right. Yeah, I had to get Is an it adapter. Is it the ACD? Yeah. Yeah, Apple I had to get an adapter. Display? I'll send you the, yeah. the 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 way it worked. But yeah, you can. Yeah, it's three Apple. To, it's, it's iMac plus two Apple displays. And it's oh, great. that's good. I have I have two yes. of those. You just need the adapters. Out how to plug it yeah. in? Yeah. Yeah, and what <laughs> I think I ended up doing from other world computing, they make a dox because I needed one extra yeah. display port or something like that, and then I was able to do it, and I've been doing that, and it's great. It's really nice to oh, have that wow. real estate. But I was worried the uh, Vega sixty four wouldn't drive a uh, second oh, yeah. monitor with a good frame oh, rate. Oh so. yeah, it looks good. It's got a lot of a lot of oomph. <laughs> oomph. Thank you, Brianna. We're, I'm really sorry that you're not going to be uh, in Congress in January. I'm really <sighs> sad about I am, that. too. It's but hard giving up a dream. Maybe you'll be there lobbying for us. That would be a good thing. And I would certainly contribute to a political action committee that was run by Brianna Wu. That's for sure. I'm going to take some time. I'm going to play some video games. I'm going to get to know my husband yeah. uh, again, yeah. who I've not spent too much time with in the last couple of oh, years. And uh, nice we're going to take it from there. Get some but, time uh, together. Yeah. yeah. I need some time to reground re myself. I think, and by the way, Inspire by You, our next show we'll be doing around the campfire and Red Dead Redemption. I think that sounds like a great, <laughs> great way to do a show. <laughs> we do. Wouldn't that be fun? Totally. Yeah, yeah Mike could bring the red eye. Yeah. Yeah. We do this show every Sunday afternoon, around 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. If you want to participate, watch live, chat along with the show. Uh, the first thing to do is go to the live stream audio or video at twit.tv slash live. And then go into the chat room at irc.twit.tv. You can use your web browser or an IRC client. Great bunch of people. They're there all week long. So uh, if you get lonely in your quarantine and you wish you had some geeks to hang out with any time of the day or night, there's always somebody at irc.twit.tv. If you uh, can't be here live, of course, because we are a 
netcast. You can get, you can get the show at our website. All right, it's a podcast. Twit.tv. Uh, all of our shows are there. Download them on demand. And uh, the other thing you could do is use a podcast player and subscribe. That way you'll get it the minute it's available, and that would help us too. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Stay well. We'll see you next week. Another Twit is in the can.